Kryptos is an enigmatic sculpture in a courtyard at the headquarters of the Central Intelligence Agency in Langley, Virginia. The sculpture holds an encrypted message that has not been fully decoded, despite numerous attempts to crack it. It's even mentioned by Dan Brown in his sensational book The Da Vinci Code. Recently, a new clue emerged which may help in finally solving the puzzle. The Kryptos Sculpture Kryptos is a 12-foot-tall copper, granite, and wood sculpture by artist James Sanborn installed in 1990 in the grounds of CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. There are actually several parts to Kryptos, all scattered around the CIA headquarters. According to Sanborn, these other elements of the sculpture are significant pieces in the as-yet-unsolved puzzle. The 1800 characters on Kryptos carved out of copper plate contain encrypted messages, of which three have been solved to date. There remains a fourth section of code at the bottom consisting of 97 or 98 characters which remains to this day uncracked. The first section of code is a poetic phrase composed by Sanborn himself. The second suggests something buried somewhere, whilst the third section is a quote from archaeologist Howard Carter's diary describing the opening of a door in King Tutankhamun's tomb on the 26th of November 1922. The first passage reads, Slowly, desperately slowly, the remains of passage debris that encumbered the lower part of the doorway was removed. With trembling hands, I made a tiny breach in the upper left-hand corner, and then, widening the hole a little, I inserted a candle and peered in. The hot air escaping from the chamber caused the flame to flicker, but presently details of the room within emerged from the mist. When decrypted, the mysterious second passage said, it was totally invisible. How is that possible? They used the Earth's magnetic field. The information was gathered and transmitted underground to an unknown location. Does Langley know about this? They should. It's buried out there somewhere. Who knows the exact location? Only WW. This was his last message. 38 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north, 77 degrees, 8 minutes, 44 seconds west. When the sculpture was unveiled on the 3rd of November 1990, Sanborn believed it would be merely a matter of weeks before the code would be cracked, but that has not proved to be the case at all. The code still eludes even the professional code breakers of the CIA and the National Security Agency. Anyone trying to crack the code has been hampered by the fact that the encrypted sections include intentional spelling errors made by Sanborn and misaligned characters set higher on a line of text than those characters around them. It took more than eight years for CIA analysts and a California computer scientist to crack three of the four coded messages on the Kryptos sculpture. However, in July 2013, a news article claimed that according to new documents obtained from the NSA, a small group of NSA crypto analysts had apparently deciphered the same three sections of Kryptos years earlier, allegedly in less than a month. It was the three analysts who solved the codes, one dealing with each section of the puzzle. Although the names are redacted in the documents released by the NSA, an article in the Baltimore Sun identified Dennis McDaniels as one of the codebreakers. The fourth section, however, had the McDaniels NSA codebreakers bewildered, as it had continued to do other crypto analysts for the last 30 years. Part of the mystery of the code on the Kryptos sculpture is that Sanborn was neither a professional code writer nor a mathematician. Yet somehow, he had created a mysterious code that the top codebreakers in the world had not been able to break. The artist admits, however, that he did have some guidance from Edward Sheet, an expert in cryptology and encryption and former chairman of the CIA's Cryptographic Center before he retired. They met in secret, and Sheed educated Sanborn on the subject of code in general, modern codes and contemporary coding systems. In a 2005 interview with Wired News, Sheet described how the code had been created. He said, I provided the cryptographic process as well as worked with him with what he was looking to do as far as the story of the sculpture would tell. We came up with a methodology using some of the known cryptographic solutions. Someone who's been trying to solve cryptos for 20 years is cryptologist and video game developer Elonka Dunin. 
Sanborn once said of Dunin that she probably knows more about Kryptos than I know. Indeed, Dunin had such a reputation as a codebreaker that Dan Brown, author of The Da Vinci Code, even named a character in the book after her. Dunin has created a website dedicated to solving the code, which has grown into a network of people committed to the common goal of solving Kryptos. Dunin said of this network, Our Kryptos community is made up of people from all around the world. We have thousands of people that are interested in Kryptos, either cracking it or helping to see it cracked. Some of them are professional code breakers, some of them are students. Carl Wang, a student of the University of California, San Diego, has created a web page with the known solutions to the code, but says that the third passage is far more difficult to crack than the first two, whilst the fourth is on another level entirely. He says on the website, the first two parts are straightforward enough that nearly anybody with a simple education in cryptography can solve. The third part is much more advanced, and the fourth part is borderline impossible. In the months after the sculpture was unveiled, Sanborn claimed that the only person who knew the solution to the Kryptos codes besides himself was William Webster, the CIA director at the time. More recently, however, Sanborn has mysteriously denied that this is the case, claiming that even Webster does not possess the whole solution of the puzzle. A new clue. In January 2020, the 74-year-old Sanborn finally released a final clue for those attempting to solve the fourth text on the Kryptos sculpture. That same month, he gave an interview on the US radio show All Things Considered about his decision to release a third and final clue, which was the word Northeast. The previous two clues were both Berlin and Clock. In the interview, Sanborn described the fourth text as a 97-character phrase, and that phrase in itself is a riddle. It's mysterious. It's going to lead to something else. It's not going to be finished when it's decoded. He also added that he hoped no one would ever solve the mystery of Kryptos. He said, I really do want Kryptos to remain secret. The plain text, the final section of Kryptos, I would prefer for it to remain secret indefinitely. Very artwork, I think. I mean, I would think that every artist would aspire to making an artwork that is not transient. It's a permanent visual, auditory, conceptual statement. And I did Kryptos with all those things in mind. And one, as an artist, one would prefer to have that piece continue giving rather than have it understood right off the bat and even more or less ignored. And so, this has lived way beyond all of my expectations, you know, at 30 years in retaining a secret that it has, and that's magic. Sanborn went on to discuss some fascinating aspects of code, code breaking, and its necessity for the present and future security of the US in the interview. He said, let's just say that if there are codes, if all codes could be cracked, then we'd be in pretty bad shape because all national secrets, all kinds of things would be available to just about anyone. And so, let's all hope that there are indecipherable codes out there, because they're often saving our lives. And so Kryptos obviously isn't that relevant, but it's hopefully doing something. It's certainly employing a lot of minds. The final code. But even if one day the final section of code is broken, we'll still not know what the sculpture means. The entire text contains a riddle which would require any investigators to be on the CIA grounds for them to solve it. Sanborn said in a 2005 interview, in part of the code that's been deciphered, I refer to an act that took place when I was at the agency and a location that's on the ground of the agency. There has been speculation as to whether he's referring to something he buried on the CIA grounds, though nobody knows for sure. The decrypted text gives latitude and longitude coordinates, when Sanborn has explained refer to locations of the agency, so anyone wanting to discover the final truth of Kryptos will first have to decipher the fourth code, then somehow find the way onto the CIA grounds and locate the place indicated by the coordinates in order to finally solve the mystery. Kryptos is Greek for hidden. If ever something was aptly named, it was the Kryptos sculpture. Nicholas Rerich was a Russian painter, scenic designer, and writer, who's probably best known for his work with Ballet Russes, and especially for his monumental historical sets. Rerich was also a mystic and traveler, 
who visited India and Tibet to study Eastern philosophy and history, and also to search for rare manuscripts. There is some evidence to suggest that during the 1930s expedition to Mongolia, led by Rarick, backed by US President Franklin D. Roosevelt, and something extremely strange was discovered. Some say that he found evidence for ancient technology, others that he unearthed a mysterious stone with strange powers. The Enigmatic Nicholas Rarick Rarick was born in St. Petersburg, Russia on October 9, 1874. He was fortunate to have been brought up in the contented environment of an upper middle-class Russian family with the advantages of contact with writers, artists and scientists who frequently came to visit him. After finishing university, he met Helena Shapostnikov, a niece of the composer Mogorsky, and soon afterwards they married. Helena Rarick was a remarkable gifted woman, a gifted pianist and author of a number of books related to mysticism, including The Foundations of Buddhism and a Russian translation of Helena Blavatsky's Secret Doctrine. 1903 and 1904, the couple set off on a voyage of discovery to 40 cities throughout Russia. Rarick's intention was to contrast the styles and historical context of Russian architecture. However, he found that many of the historical structures had been neglected for centuries. Realizing their importance to Russia's cultural history, he set out to draw attention to the problem by painting a series of 75 works depicting the structures and also attempted to have them protected and preserved. Archaeological treasures from the Stone Age were of particular interest to him, and soon he amassed a large collection of artifacts from that period. In 1920, he emigrated to the United States, and that same year, in New York, founded with his wife the Agni Yoga Society, an organization that combines elements of Eastern thought with modern Western moral philosophy. Rarick was given the position of secretary of the School of the Society for the Encouragement of Art, later becoming its head, the first of a number of positions that he would hold as a teacher and spokesman for the arts. He brought an innovative and modern system of training in art to the society, organizing the teaching of all of the arts, painting, music, singing, dance, theater, and also ceramics, painting on porcelain, pottery, and mechanical drawing in the same place. Rarick seems to have had talents for synthesis, which enabled him to correlate many apparently contradictory subjects, the philosophical with the scientific, the Eastern wisdom with Western knowledge, for example. Whilst in America, the Raricks planned a voyage to India. The couple had always wanted to visit there, and there is certainly an orientation towards Eastern spiritual values reflected in many of Rarick's creative works at that time. A Voyage to the East In 1923, Rarick's dream finally came true when they embarked on their Central Asian tour. They landed in Bombay in December 1923, eventually visiting India, Chinese Turkestan, Altay, Mongolia and Tibet. Nicholas later wrote about this expedition in his book, Heart of Asia, in which he described these mysterious lands and enigmatic peoples. During the expedition, Rerick's party apparently discovered enigmatic archaeological monuments and extremely rare manuscripts, though it's not clear now where those manuscripts are. One of the manuscripts was said to be a blueprint for an ancient Atlantean particle accelerator there, which he brought back to the US to be developed. In 1928, at the end of their major expedition, the family settled in the Kulu Valley, six and a half thousand feet up in the Himalayan foothills. Here they established the headquarters of the Urasvati Himalayan Research Institute, which was instituted to study the results of their expedition and of their forthcoming explorations. When Rarick returned to the US in 1929, he was famous. James Walker, the mayor of New York, greeted him at the City Hall and President Franklin Roosevelt met him. Nicholas Rarick died in Kalu on December 13, 1947. Rarick is now seen as perhaps the complete representative of Russian symbolism and modernism and has left a considerable legacy. Over 7,000 of his paintings are exhibited in well-known art galleries all over the world. He also wrote many books on various subjects, 
including tales, legends, poetry, and commentaries on life and events. Another of Rarick's legacies is the Treaty on the Protection of Artistic and Scientific Institutions and Historic Monuments, popularly known as the Rarick Pact. This was an inter-American treaty stating that the defense of cultural objects is more important than the use or destruction of that culture for military purposes. It was signed on April 15, 1935, and although it never became international law, its ideas were extremely influential in setting standards for future cultural preservation. The 1934-5 Expedition and Mysterious Ancient Technology In 1934-35, Nicholas Rarick headed an expedition sent to areas of Inner Mongolia, Manchuria and China by the U.S. Ministry of Agriculture with the purpose of studying drought-resistant plants. Rarick had considerable support from the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Henry A. Wallace, who himself had a deep interest in theosophy and mysticism. President Franklin Roosevelt, also no stranger to mysticism, being a Freemason himself, was also enamored of Rarick. Some researchers questioned the stated nature of this expedition, believing it had more mysterious purposes. It is certainly true that the British Secret Intelligence Service had long suspected Rarick of some undisclosed nefarious activities. One or two researchers even believe that Rarick might even have been a spy for the Soviet Union. Indeed, by the end of 1935, both Roosevelt and Wallace were beginning to cut ties with Rarick due to his apparent pro-Japanese activities and contact with the Japanese War Ministry and Foreign Office during his time in the East. The Chintamani Stone In 1933, Rarick painted a symbolistic work called The White Stone, sign of Sintamani or Horse of Happiness. In Buddhist and Hindu tradition, the Sintamani Stone was said to be a wish-fulfilling jewel which fell from the sky in Tibet inside a chest filled with three other ancient artifacts. The Sintamani Stone, which translates roughly to Thought Gem or Wishing Stone, is said by some mystics and paranormal researchers to be of an extraterrestrial origin and was brought to Earth by emissaries from a planet orbiting the star Sirius. It was given to Shambhala's principal resident, the mysterious King of the World, a monarch known by many Eastern mystics and only by a select few in the West. In Tibetan tradition, whoever held the stone held the key to Shambhala, a mythical kingdom in Tibetan Buddhism. According to one tradition throughout history, the Sintamani has been an important instrument of the divine, intended to guide humanity in the right direction, given freely only to those people thought worthy of its vast power. Such famous figures such as King Solomon, Genghis Khan and Akbar the Great are said to have possessed the Sintamani Stone. For a number of treasure hunters, the Sintamani Stone is as real as the Philosopher's Stone or the Holy Grail, and many have searched in vain to find it. Apparently, Rarick knew that the Shambhala was believed to be the earthly link to heaven and that its realm on Earth lay in a secret valley somewhere deep in the Himalayas. Some believe that Rarick's expedition found the Lost Valley in the Himalayas and was also able to locate the Sintamani Stone. Once he had obtained the fabled stone, Rarick apparently described it as a piece of Moldavite, an olive-green or blue-greenish vitreous silica projectile rock formed by a meteorite impact probably in southern Germany. Rarick allegedly also discovered Sanskrit lettering inscribed upon it, which he translated to read, Through the stars I come, I bring the chalice covered with a shield, within it I bring treasure. In one version of events, Rarick then took the Sintamani Stone to Europe, supposedly to help form the League of Nations. However, after the collapse of the League, Rarick took the stone back to Tibet, where it's said to remain to this day. In his 1930 book, Shambhala Rarick records the following conversation about the Sintamani stone with a Tibetan Lama. Do you know in the West something about the great stone in which magic powers are concentrated? And do you know from which planet this came? And who possessed this treasure? Lama, about the great stone, we have as many legends as you have images of Chintamani, 
From the old Druidic times, many nations remember these legends of truth about the natural energies concealed in this strange visitor to our planet. Very often in such fallen stones are hidden diamonds, but these are nothing in comparison with some other unknown metals and energies which are found every day in the stones and in the numerous currents and rays. Lapis Exilis thus is named the stone, which is mentioned by the old Meister Singers. One sees that the West and East are working together on many principles. We do not need to go on to the deserts to hear the stone. In our cities, in our scientific laboratories, we have other legends and proofs. Would anyone have thought that the fairy tales regarding the flying man would ever be fulfilled? Yet now, each day's mail, each day's visitors may come flying. Unpublished 17th century AD alchemical documents reveal Sir Isaac Newton's private Egyptian pyramid studies in his quest to calculate a date for the end of days. In July 1936 AD, a metal chest surfaced at Sotheby's auction house in London filled with Isaac Newton's unpublished, private, handwritten papers and lab books. After economist John Maynard Keynes bought the treasure chest, he was shocked to find Newton was not only a force in mathematical theory, astronomy and optics, but that he was also a clandestine esoteric theologist and an alchemist questing otherworldly realms beyond physics with the assistance of supernatural forces. According to Sam Keynes, Newton, the last magician, the great man of science was secretly Europe's leading alchemist and believed his deepest universal insights came from his communications with ancient spirits. Having spent decades exploring the macro and micro mechanics of the universe, seeking a date for Armageddon, Newton is believed to have decoded it from the measurements and proportions of the legendary Solomon's Temple. But now, more unpublished papers reveal a key step in Newton's search for the date of Armageddon, the quest to find a hidden mathematical code within the dimensions of the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Isaac Newton's new papers worth a small fortune. Isaac Newton has always been the number one primary icon for rational thinking, logic and reason. So when his alchemical interests were first revealed, it was a great embarrassment to the scientific community, and it's happening again. The works revealing more of Newton's attempts to ascertain a date for the apocalypse are now being sold by Sotheby's and show his genius interpretations of the geometry, scale, and proportions of the Great Pyramid of Egypt. According to a report in The Guardian, Gabriel Heaton, Sotheby's manuscript specialist, says the papers take you remarkably quickly straight to the heart of a number of the deepest questions Newton was investigating. He added that the three papers are expected to fetch hundreds of thousands of pounds at auction next Tuesday. The Sotheby's antique specialist said Newton was trying to uncover the unit of measurement used by those constructing the pyramids as he suspected it would disclose a microcosmic expression of the measure of the Earth. Isaac Newton master of the universe. Newton studied the pyramids in the 1680s, but his real goal was to calculate the prime measurements of the biblical temple of Solomon, in which he was convinced the date for the apocalypse was embedded. Heaton says the alchemist was looking for proof for his theory of gravitation, and he believed the secrets of ancient Egyptian alchemy would provide the required evidence. Building on Heaton's suggestion, a four-part series of research articles was published in 2016. In the first installment, Isaac Newton and the Temple of Doom, it was presented Newton's study of the Temple of Solomon, the Philosopher's Stone and the Emerald Tablet. Newton believed the Emerald Tablet had alchemical Egyptian origins, and as he matured, it satisfied his theological thirst. 
The ten magical lines of the tablet became a foundation for Newton's cosmological outlook and his developments of universal models. We would go so far as to suggest the Emerald Tablet actually inspired the alchemists' most famous universal laws. For example, line 10 of the Emerald Tablet says, its force is above all force, for it vanquishes every subtle thing and penetrates every solid thing. Pop culture tells us that Newton conceived the concept of gravity after an apple fell on his head. But read this 10th line again and you'll see how succinctly and clearly the sentence describes gravity, which is defined by modern science as the force that attracts a body towards the center of the Earth or towards any other physical body having mass. Isaac Newton and the End of Time In a letter dated 1704, which is currently on display at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Newton explained that after 30 years of analyzing the measurements, ratios, proportions, and architectural features in ancient buildings, he had unearthed a secret number system within the biblical books of Daniel and the Revelations. And from his secret code, he declared the prophetic year 2060 AD as the date for Armageddon, the end of days. But just how many of his paradigm-shifting scientific achievements resulted from his quest for the Philosopher's Stone and his translation of the Emerald Tablet of Hermes? Newton's Secret Treasure, acquired by John Maynard Keynes. While Isaac Newton was regarded a towering sentinel of the scientific method on a global platform, he was secretly a deeply mystical, magical, and animistic thinker. The Newton Project website provides scans of papers written by John Maynard Keynes offering researchers insights into Newton's inner thoughts. For example, the universe was a cryptogram set by the Almighty. Newton set out to read the riddle of the Godhead, of past and future events divinely foreordained. And according to Keynes, Newton turned to the early philosophical works of the 16th century European intellectuals who formed the Mystical Secret Society, the ancient mystical order Rosicrucis, better known as the Rosicrucians. Deeply religious and anti-Catholic, just like Newton, the Rosicrucians strive to create a liquid called the Elixir Vitae, and substance called the Philosopher's Stone required to produce limitless amounts of gold. Michael White's 1999 book, Isaac Newton, The Last Sorcerer, tells us Newton owned 169 books on alchemy, including a highly annotated English translation of Thomas Vaughan's Rosicrucian Manifestos, The Fame and Confession of the Fraternity R.C., and The Themis Aurea by Michael Mayer, a classic early work on the origins of Gnosticism and the Rosicrucian movement. A quote by Keynes published in Sir Isaac Newton, The Last Sorcerer, perfectly summarizes the importance Newton assigned to alchemy in his quest for unusual truths. Newton was motivated by a deep-rooted commitment to the notion that the alchemical wisdom extended back to ancient times. Controversy over the Shakespearean authorship is not new. It has existed ever since the 18th century. For some, Shakespeare's plays must have been written by a more obviously accomplished writer, such as Edward de Vere, the 7th century of Oxford, Sir Francis Bacon, the playwright Christopher Marlowe, Sir Walter Raleigh, John Donne, and even Queen Elizabeth I. But could these plays have been authored jointly by a mysterious group called the Knights of the Helmet? This invisible order, dedicated to Pallas Athene, seems to have started at Gray's in London, with Francis Bacon, the acknowledged leader of an extremely talented group of Rosicrucians and Freemasons. Francis Bacon and the Knights of the Helmet Francis Bacon, one of the leading figures in natural philosophy and in the field of scientific methodology, was born on the 22nd of January 1561 in London, the son of Sir Nicholas Bacon, keeper of the Great Seal for Elizabeth I. Bacon studied at Cambridge University and at Gray's Inn and became a Member of Parliament in 1584. Bacon's political career prospered 
and in 1618 he was appointed Lord Chancellor, the most powerful position in England, and in 1621 he was created Viscount St Albans. However, soon after this he was charged by Parliament with accepting bribes, which he admitted. He was later fined and imprisoned and then banished from court. Although he was later pardoned, this was the end of Bacon's political life. He retired to his home at Gorhambury in Hertfordshire and died in London on the 9th of April 1626. There are certainly some mysteries surrounding Bacon's life. He's believed by some researchers to have been a member of a number of secret societies, including a Freemasons and German secret philosophical society, the Rosicrucians. Another mysterious organization which Bacon was allegedly a member of was the Knights of the Helmet, an order dedicated to Pallas Athene, who carried a spear and wore a great helmet, a symbol of secrecy. According to Greek myth, anyone who wears the helmet becomes invisible. This society was a gifted group of gentlemen based at Gray's Inn, London, of whom Francis Bacon was the acknowledged leader. Some Baconian scholars believe that the idea behind this group was to create a series of classical literary works which would educate the English people and transform them into a nation that one day would dominate the world. Other researchers take this a step further, claiming that the Knights of the Helmet conceal the fact that Bacon actually was Shakespeare, and that Shakespeare is a synonym for Apollo and Athena. They were both known as Shakers of the Spear, and the spear represents a ray of wisdom. Is it possible that the Shakespeare plays were written as a collective work by the Knights of the Helmet? This would explain why Bacon employed such a large group of writers, poets, code breakers, and other educated people around him. In his 1928 work, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, Canadian author and mystic Manly P. Hall wrote about the mysteries surrounding Bacon and Shakespeare, saying, The Bacon-Shakespeare controversy involves the most profound aspects of science, religion, and ethics. He who solves its mystery may yet find therein the key to the supposedly lost wisdom of antiquity. Even though most advocates for someone other than Shakespeare having written plays do not take the Knights of the Helmet theory seriously, they still believe that Bacon is the leading contender for their authorship. In the search for the real author of Shakespeare's plays in the late 19th century, American writer Delia Bacon proposed that the author was none other than Sir Francis Bacon, to whom she was not actually related. Her vehement arguments against Shakespeare as the author of the plays eventually reached the ears of a riverboat pilot on the Mississippi, Samuel Clemens, who would later become the most famous writer in the United States, Mark Twain. But it was not until the very end of his career that Twain returned to Delia Bacon's theories. At a dinner at his house in January 1909, Twain's circle of friends proved to themselves that it was possible to find the coded signature Francisco Bacono in a sequence of letters from the first folio of Shakespeare's plays. So, could Francis Bacon have authored the plays? Bacon was born three years before Shakespeare and certainly possessed the intellectual ability and knowledge to have written the plays. Shakespeare could not have known the workings of the court, both in England and on the continent, whereas Bacon knew the court extremely well. Well, he was brought up in it. Fortunately, some of Bacon's plays or court entertainment survive. Unfortunately, they're totally lacking in literary ability and artistic style, with stock characters, no grasp of a plot, and a distinct lack of ability to describe characters. In short, these works are about as far away from Shakespeare's plays as it was possible to be at the time. But what of Shakespeare himself? Could he be the author of the Shakespearean plays? William Shakespeare William Shakespeare was born in 1564 in Stratford-upon-Avon, Warwickshire, England, and died on the 23rd of April 1616 in Stratford-upon-Avon. There is a large amount of factual knowledge about Shakespeare, but unfortunately the majority of it comes from official documents. Documents concerning the great writer include dates of baptisms, marriages, deaths and burials, wills, conveyances, legal processes and payments by the court. There are also, however, a number of contemporary references to him as a writer. At the age of 18, Shakespeare was married, though where and exactly when are unknown. 
But there is evidence in the form of a marriage license which was issued for the marriage of William Shakespeare and Anne Hathaway of Stratford. On the 26th of May, 1583, the couple's first child, a daughter named Susanna, was baptized in a Stratford church. On the 2nd of February, 1585, twins were baptized, Hamnet and Judith. Hamnet, Shakespeare's only son, died 11 years later. The great enigma of Shakespeare's life, and one that has led to much controversy, including that over the authorship of his plays, is what happened to him next. The eight years between the birth of his twins and when his name begins to appear in London theatre records are a complete mystery. Theories as to what happened to Shakespeare during these lost years include that he travelled around England and abroad, worked as a schoolmaster in the country, was a soldier and law clerk, or became a devoted member of the Roman Catholic Church. Many scholars believe that when the London theatres were closed by order of the Privy Council on June 23, 1592, Shakespeare had already been working as an actor and writer on the professional stage in London for four or five years, which would account for most of the lost time of his life. The authorities closed the theatres as they had been worried about a severe outbreak of the plague and concerned at the possibility of civil unrest due to their decision. When the theatre eventually reopened in June 1594, the theatrical companies had been reorganised and Shakespeare was a full member of a theatre troupe known as the Lord Chamberlain's Men, who in 1603 became the King's Men. By 1592, Shakespeare was already well known enough as a writer to have been the subject of Robert Greene's attack on what he called the upstart crow in Greene's Groatsworth of Wit. However, play scripts and their authors were generally given low status in the literary system of the time, and when scripts were published, it was their connection with the theatrical company rather than to the scriptwriter which was publicised. Shakespeare had to wait until 1597 for his name to appear on the title page of his plays Richard II and a revised edition of Romeo and Juliet. One significant piece of evidence that Shakespeare was now enjoying great success as a playwright and was trying to help out his family is the fact that a coat of arms was granted to his father, John Shakespeare, in 1596. Altogether, Shakespeare's complete works include 38 plays, two narrative poems, 154 sonnets and a variety of other poems. No original manuscripts of Shakespeare's plays are known to exist today, though of course some may be held in private collections. It's essentially due to a group of actors from Shakespeare's company that we have about half of his plays today. This group collected them for publication after Shakespeare died, preserving the plays. The writings were later collected together in what is known as the First Folio, Folio refers to the size of the paper used. This contained 36 of his plays, but none of his poetry. The question of whether Shakespeare actually wrote his plays is an extremely controversial one, but it has to be said that readers and theatre-goers in Shakespeare's own lifetime, and up until the late 18th century, never questioned Shakespeare's authorship of his plays. He was a well-known actor from Stratford who performed in London's leading acting company among the great actors of the day. Shakespeare was also widely known by leading writers of the time, including Ben Jonson and John Webster, both of whom admired him as a dramatist. Many other tributes to him as an extremely talented writer appeared during his lifetime. Consequently, any theory that suggests that he was not the writer of the plays and poems attributed to him must assume that Shakespeare's contemporaries were universally fooled by some type of secret arrangement, a huge literary hoax, which is surely an absurd idea. According to researchers, due to the extremely strict nature of the church authorities at the time, Michelangelo, one of history's greatest artists, hid secret messages in his most famous work. In a panel named Separation of Light from Darkness, two neuroscientists believe that they have discovered a hidden sketch of the human brain. Other researchers have discovered depictions of optic nerves, brain stems, kidneys and other organs in the images in the Sistine Chapel. But what was Michelangelo trying to say by including these hidden images in his great work? 
Michelangelo was born on the 6th of March, 1475, in Caprice, Florence, Italy. He was a Renaissance sculptor, painter, architect, and poet whose influence on the development of Western art is profound. Many of his works in painting, sculpture, and architecture are among the most famous art in existence. Michelangelo thought of himself mainly as a sculptor, and indeed, he worked in marble sculpture all his life whilst he worked in other arts only during certain periods. Michelangelo was considered the greatest living artist during his own lifetime, one effect of which is that his career was more fully documented than that of any other artist of the time or earlier. In fact, he was the first Western artist who had biographies published about him while he was still alive. Perhaps Michelangelo's greatest achievement, and also the best known, are his frescoes on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. The Sistine Chapel is a papal chapel in the Vatican Palace that was erected in 1473-81 by the architect Giovanni de Dolci for Pope Sixtus IV, from whom it gets its name. The chapel already contained distinguished wall paintings by various well-known artists when Michelangelo was asked to add works for the comparatively unimportant ceiling when he was 33 years old. Michelangelo's frescoes on the ceiling are collectively known as the Sistine Ceiling and were commissioned by Pope Julius II in 1508 and were painted by him from 1508 to 1512. Measuring 12,000 square feet, the spectacular work includes nine scenes from the Old Testament and more than 300 lifelike figures. From 1534 to 1541, Michelangelo painted the Last Judgment fresco on the West Wall for Pope Paul III. These two gigantic frescoes are now considered among the greatest achievements of Western painting. The panel, The Creation of Adam, where God and Adam's fingers almost touch, is one of the most recognizable and copied works of art in history. One lesser known fact is that Michelangelo was also an anatomist. At the age of 17, he had begun his career by dissecting corpses from the church graveyard, but the great artist concealed this interest from the public by destroying the majority of his anatomical sketches and notes. But researchers now believe he used some of these sketches in his paintings on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel cunningly hidden from the eyes of Pope Julius II, religious worshippers, historians, and art lovers for five centuries. In 1990, physician Frank Lynn Messberger discovered something strange in the creation of Adam. It was, he thought, a brain hidden in the figure of God where the robes of the angels at his side intertwine. Meshberger published his findings in the Journal of the American Medical Association, concluding that the depiction in God creating Adam in the central panel on the Sistine Chapel ceiling was a textbook anatomical illustration of the human brain in cross-section. Meshberger also speculated that Michelangelo surrounded God with a shroud representing the human brain because he wanted to suggest that God was bestowing not only life on Adam, but also supreme human intelligence. But this was by far from being the end of the research into Michelangelo's hidden messages. Ian Suk and Raphael Tamago, experts in neuroanatomy at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, made further claims about hidden images in Michelangelo's paintings. They concluded in the study that in the depiction of God, in separation of light from darkness, there is evidence that Michelangelo had included concealed images of a brain stem and a spinal cord. In the separation of light from darkness, Dr. Tamago discovered lines and shapes which were different from the normal external anatomy of the neck, anomalies that he believes cannot be accidental. He said, the anatomy of the neck is very, very unusual, and if we were not intentionally drawn that way, you would have to postulate that Michelangelo had a very bad day, which is very unlikely because he was very meticulous. Michelangelo definitely knew how to depict necks. He knew anatomy so well. That's why it was such a mystery why this particular neck looked so odd. But not everyone agrees that Michelangelo left secret messages in his Sistine Chapel paintings. Joanna Woods Marsden, a professor of art history at the University of California, Los Angeles, was shocked by the author's theories. She said, My initial reaction on looking at the illustrations is that this is complete nonsense, to put it politely. 
to draw arbitrary lines all over Renaissance paintings and expect to be taken seriously by the scholarly community. Brian A. Curran, an associate professor of art history at Pennsylvania State University, shared this opinion, but was somewhat milder in his criticism, saying, I think this may be another case of the authors looking too hard for something they want to find. I don't want to discourage people from looking, but sometimes a neck is just a neck. But the subject of Michelangelo's hidden images was far from closed. One example is a ram's skull that resembles a uterus, appears eight times throughout the painting. Dr. D. Vista Campos, researcher in human anatomy at the Federal University of Health Sciences of Porto Alegre in Brazil, was the lead author of the article. He concluded that the allusions to the female reproductive system in the artwork are a concealed attack on Catholic misogyny, and that Michelangelo believed Christianity could learn a lot from the more matriarchal traditions of Judaism and the pagan world. In April 2008, a book called The Sistine Secrets, Michelangelo's Forbidden Messages in the Heart of the Vatican by Rabbi Benjamin Bletch and Roy Dolinaire appeared. This work claimed to be a revelation of coded anti-Pope and anti-Rome messages embedded in the frescoes of the Sistine Chapel. But this time the messages were not in the form of anatomical drawings. The authors discovered signs in the works of Michelangelo that suggest the Renaissance master painter had studied Jewish wisdom literature such as the Kabbalah and hidden religious symbols in his paintings. In the preface to the book, the authors state, unknown to most viewers, is the dramatic truth that these frescoes contain a lost mystical message of universal love dangerously contrary to church doctrine in Michelangelo's day. But true to the original teachings of the Bible, as well as to much of contemporary liberal Christian thought, driven by the truths he had come to recognize during his years of study in private non-traditional schooling in Florence, truths rooted in his involvement with Judaic texts as well as Kabbalistic training that conflicted with approved Christian doctrine. Michelangelo needed to find a way to let viewers discern what he truly believed. He couldn't allow the church to forever silence his soul. And what the church would permit him to communicate openly, he ingeniously found a way to convey to those diligent enough to learn his secret language. The Taking of Christ is a painting of the arrest of Jesus by the Italian artist Caravaggio, originally painted in 1602. One mysterious aspect of the work is its depiction of an enigmatic figure who's holding a lantern and looking intently at the action happening before him. There has been much speculation about who the figure is supposed to be, though most believe it to be a self-portrait of the artist himself. By the late 18th century, the painting was thought to have somehow disappeared, and its whereabouts remained unknown for about 200 years until it was discovered by chance in Dublin Island in the 1990s. Where had the lost masterpiece been for two centuries, and why had it disappeared? Italian painter Michelangelo Marisa di Caravaggio was born on the 19th of September in 1571 in Milan. Caravaggio is the name of the artist's hometown in Lombardy in northern Italy. After losing both of his parents to the plague when he was a child, he trained as a painter under Simone Petrozano, who had himself studied under the famous painter Titian. In 1592, at the age of 21, he moved to Rome, Italy's artistic center, where for the first few years he struggled as a painter. He specialized in still lifes, mainly of fruit and flowers, and later half-length figures in the Baroque style, which he sold on the streets of the city. Caravaggio's short life was followed by mystery and intrigue. Constantly in trouble with the law, he wrecked his own apartment, spent time in jail on several occurrences, and eventually had a death warrant circulated on him by the Pope. He had a particularly violent temper and was arrested a number of times for slashing the cloak of an adversary, throwing a plate of artichokes at a waiter, scarring a guard, and abusing the police. This was in addition to a murder charge after he killed another man, accidentally he claimed, in a sword fight. In 1608, while still wanted for the murder in Rome, he attacked and wounded Father Giovanni Rodomonte Roero, 
one of the most senior knights of the Order of St. John in Malta. This organization were Christian soldiers waging guerrilla warfare against the forces of Islam from their secure island fortress in the Mediterranean. Although Caravaggio went to prison for the assault, he later managed to escape from the rock-cut cell with the aid of an accomplice. He evaded the castle guard, scaled the ramparts and lowered himself down a sheer 200-foot precipice and boarded a boat awaiting him below. He escaped to Naples, but Ruero's men later found him there and attacked him, severely disfiguring his face. Caravaggio later moved to Naples, Malta and Sicily and died probably of malaria in Porto Ercole near Grosseto in Tuscany in 1610. There are some, however, who believe that Caravaggio was murdered, perhaps by members of the Order of St. John. Caravaggio produced masterpieces of incredible complexity and power, advancing the Baroque style to include depictions of real people of the streets surrounded by blunt emotional truth. Spurned after his death, Caravaggio is now recognized as one of the fathers of modern painting. He said of his art, all works, no matter what or by whom painted, are nothing but bagatelles and childish trifles, unless they are made and painted from life, and there can be nothing better than to follow nature. The Taking of Christ is a painting by Caravaggio, which depicts the moments Judas betrayed Christ and his capture by Roman soldiers. The work, painted in oil, measures 53 inches by 63 inches. Caravaggio painted the extraordinary taking of Christ for the Roman Marquis Siriaco Matei in 1602. In the painting, Caravaggio presented an entirely novel view of biblical stories, placing the figures close to the picture plane and making the use of powerful light and dark contrast, giving the scene an astonishing sense of drama. All the subjects in the masterpiece are rendered in profile or partial light, with no one looking directly out to the audience. The paintings normally depict the action only, there is no visible background. In the work, Judas has identified Christ with a kiss as the temple guards approach to seize him. The disciples attempt to escape, while on the far left stands St. John the Evangelist, facing away from the action and raising his hands in despair. Jesus offers no resistance to his destiny. In all, there are seven figures in the painting, John, Jesus, Judas, three soldiers, and a man holding a lantern to light the events. This strange man has been the subject of controversy for hundreds of years. Who was he and why was he standing at the far edge of the painting, holding a lantern? Scholars were sure that he wasn't any biblical character they were aware of. Perhaps both he and his lantern symbolized some secret that only Caravaggio was aware of. Nowadays, however, most art critics believe the mysterious figure is a depiction of Caravaggio himself, observing the events, a device he often used in paintings. Caravaggio's taking of Christ was a well-documented commission and was often copied by other artists of the time. In fact, there are at least 12 known copies of the painting in existence. At least one is believed to be the original copy made by Caravaggio himself. It is known that the masterpiece was sold by the family in 1802. However, by the late 18th century, the original painting had seemingly disappeared. Nothing was heard of the work for 200 years until scholars began searching for it in the 1940s, as many researchers no longer accepted the authenticity of a painting in the Odessa Art Museum in the Ukraine, now known to be a copy made for a member of the Matei family in 1626. However, their search proved fruitless and the painting was thought lost forever. However, a few decades later in the early 1990s, a young art student named Francesca Capaletti made an astonishing discovery. She found a note related to the painting in the archives of the Matteis, once one of Rome's wealthiest and most powerful noble families, explaining that the taking of Christ was originally commissioned around 1602 for Siriaco Mattei, an enthusiastic art collector. Capaletti and her research partner undertook further research and were able to trace the painting through the Mattei archives up to the late 1700s, when it was unaccountably mislabeled as a work by one of Caravaggio's less talented students, the minor Dutch Golden Age painter Gerard van Honthrost. 
The researchers discovered that the Maté family began selling pieces of their huge art collection accumulated during the early 19th century. The painting, still at the time attributed to Van Honthorst, was bought by the Scottish politician William Hamilton Nesbitt and remained in his possession until 1921. In that year, the painting was then put up for auction in Edinburgh and bought for eight guineas by an art dealer who seemed to have sold it to an Irish doctor named Mary Leah Wilson. The wife of a captain in the Royal Irish Constabulary, RIC, the English Army's police force in Ireland. After the death of her husband in 1920, Leah Wilson joined the staff of St. Patrick Dunn's Hospital and became a well-known paediatrician. In 1924, she sent the painting to cabinet makers and furniture restorers James Hicks in Dublin for repairs, possibly to the frame. In the early 1930s, Dr. Lee Wilson gave the paintings as a gift to a Jesuit priest, Father Thomas Finlay. Father Finlay was living in the Jesuit House of Writers at Lower Leeson Street in Dublin, and the painting was hung opposite in the fireplace of the dining room. Around the same time, Capoletti was uncovering the mysterious life of the paintings in the Matteo archive. The Jesuits asked Sergio Benedetti, an Italian conservator at the National Gallery of Ireland, to assess their collection of paintings as some were in need of restoration. After cleaning one of the paintings, Benedetti realized it was actually the original Taking of Christ by Caravaggio. The painting worth tens of millions of euros had been hanging, covered in dust, in the dining room, unrecognized for almost nearly 60 years. Benedetti's work, combined with Capoletti's findings, led to the confirmation of the discovery. After the painting was professionally cleaned and authenticated, it was revealed to an astonished art world to be the lost Caravaggio, entitled The Taking of Christ. In 1993, it was given to the Irish state on indefinite loan by the Jesuits and unveiled to the public in the National Gallery of Ireland in the same year. In November 1993, The Taking of Christ was the centerpiece of the exhibition Caravaggio, The Master Revealed curated by Benedetti, which publicly announced its attribution to the Baroque master Caravaggio and confirmed Benedetti's vital role in one of the great art discoveries of the 20th century. Other than a few short loans to other museums, the taking of Christ has hung in the National Gallery of Ireland ever since.